Let's dive into it. Brought, brought to us by our friends at the CBO. I heard uh, Liz and Jenny, they, they did an awesome job this week at the RMC conference. Uh, lots of good feedback from that. Yeah, I honestly love that they started doing that. Uh, I think it's a great addition to the show for sure. All right. Introduction, ratios and percentages drive most decisions in our trading and everyday lives, but they're only as honest as the denominators behind them. When looking at numbers, it is important to understand the true context behind them, or they can lead to some misleading results. So when we're looking at fractions, the numerator condition is the top number that shows how many parts of a whole you have. So this beautiful pizza, uh, which we destroyed yesterday during lunch, (laughs) <laughs> eight slices out of eight slices, that's a whole pizza. It equals one. The denominator population is the bottom number that shows how many equal parts the whole is divided into. Um, so yeah, first thoughts here. Numbers are numbers, but you always have to weigh it against the denominator to get you know the true scope of things, uh, which I think we'll see in the coming slides. My first thought is it's it's hilarious that the research team is mansplaining <laughs> fractions. <either. laughs> and with visuals of pizza. Yeah, they just can't yeah. get away from it. It's your, this is definitely Lou Malnati's. It looks like it. It looks like a Lou's pie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's pop over to the next slide. Dive a little deeper into this. So common headlines you've probably seen. Crime has doubled in city X, Y, and Z. Uh, how about crime has doubled in Chicago? I hear that all the time. We go on the road and people are like, how are you still alive? Aren't there shootings? <laughs> no, no, there's not. Uh, there, are, there are, but they're, you know, in, in other areas. It's not everywhere. Uh, 40 more COVID cases reported. The Dow Jones is down 1,000 points. What does that really mean? Uh, why they differ in usefulness? Crime doubled. Somewhat useful. Gives a relative percentage change, though still not perfect. Doesn't really matter what city and also, going back to the denominator topic we uh, had just a slide ago, if you had one crime reported and then you went to two, crime doubling doesn't really mean anything. You know, Of course, if the crime is way worse, that's, that's another thing. But numbers, you need to weigh them against what you're talking about as a whole. I think that's what we're getting here. Uh, from these slides. 40 COVID cases, misleading without context. 40 cases in a country like New Zealand was taken very seriously because they were pretty COVID free uh, during that period of time. While 40 cases in the US, that was a drop in the bucket. Yeah, context matters. I mean, that's the most important thing here. And uh, as somebody who who did science for years, I mean, that's that's exactly it. Uh, The job is to always put the numbers into context so that they make sense to people. Exactly. And make them actionable, too. I think that's another important point that we'll we'll hit on here. Next slide, please. Ooh, the 1987 crash. I was just a thought at this point in time. As for the stock market, think about headlines you saw during the 1987 crash compared to now. In 1987, 500 points was a big deal in the Dow. Now the Dow can move up or down more than that in just a couple of hours, and it's considered relatively normal. Um, not seeing it now, but yeah, we're, we have a very flat market, and the Dow is up 60 points. So all things considered, market moves now are not the same as market moves almost 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, these these were these were dark times, Mikey. I mean, the year before we had the Challenger crash. I mean, the teachers rolled out the TV in the class and showed it to us, and then it happened. And you're like, "What did I just see?" And then '87 was the crash, and it was, it was talked about a lot. I don't remember any details per se. I wasn't paying attention to the market like that. I just remember, you know, you just hear about things on the news, and it was obviously crazy times. Yeah, for sure. Um, and when you look at it in today's world. drop, what would that mean in the Dow? 22% would be almost a 9,000 point move uh, in the Dow. So think about the difference there. 20% 20 move in the E-minis would be a 1,200 point move. My God. Imagine that. Imagine if we had a a limit down situation, down 1,200 points. It would be absolutely insane. But Again, we're, we're equating the actual number with the denominator, which is the current value of these products. So percentage-based 
explanations uh, are always going to be paramount when it comes to putting context around what we're talking about. Single day, I'm going to say that's impossible to even happen now. There's too many measures in place to prevent such types of moves. Yeah. Yeah. We've got uh, the limit downs. We've got the buy the dippers. But I mean, we saw it like this year has been we joke about it. We're like, OK, don't go. We only go up. But we have seen some violent moves to the downside. It's just that they were gobbled up pretty quickly thereafter. So uh, it's it will be interesting to see what is happening in the world to where we are if we go back if and when we go back to those 200 300 point sell off days that are consecutive like what what is the thing in the world that's going to create that scenario scary thought yeah exactly i mean even though we 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 had tariffs on the horizon going back to last year but we had no idea that they were going to move us down 20% effectively is what happened over about a 6 week period so we we had no idea and we'll see what the next thing is Yeah, I'll never forget. I was on air with uh, Ilya and Chris on overtime when that was happening. And initially it was like, oh, 10 percent across the board and the market was ripping higher. And then he brought out the poster board and the poster (laughs) board (laughs) was like, no, 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 10 percent minimum, but 50, 60, 100 here, there. That's when the market just completely reversed and dropped out. Uh, But it's recovered since. It's been it's been a wild ride. Yeah, sure has. Next slide, please. Largest changes in the SPX. So this is interesting. So again, putting context around these numbers, what do these net changes relate to when it comes to a percentage? Take the five largest net daily gains and losses in the SPX, where you might think the biggest moves happened more recently. For some cases, like the largest drops, that is true, with 2020 being greater than 2008 percentage-wise. For other cases, like the largest gains, This is false, with 2020 being less than 2008 percentage-wise. And of course, you see this with the ranks. None of the recent ones were the number one percentage moves. That honor still belongs to 1987. So like Jamal said, we have things in place to kind of prevent these insane moves where once you reach a certain point, it's, it's no longer the market. It's the human reaction, the fear reaction. And... Uh, of course, these things were put in place to kind of prevent that, and create more stability in these markets. But like we're saying here, what is a 10% move in a couple of days in the E-minis now? It's 600 points, 670 points. It's a huge move that I, I can't even imagine seeing a day where we're down 200, down 200 again, and then down 200 again. But it's certainly possible. We just uh, we're in this low VIX environment where the market's not telling us that we should expect it too much. Yeah, and and to, with these dates here, I mean, when I see these, it just tells you how prominent 2008 and 2020 were in the markets, and the fact that they're going to stay around for a long time. When you look at lists like this, is is fascinating. Absolutely. Moving along to the next it's slide, interesting that one of our year, one of the, one of the days from this year though is in there. It's fast. That's yeah. so not nothing. Yeah, totally. Uh, account sizes. So bringing this together uh, from a different lens, larger accounts naturally allow access to wider ranges of strategies because the same percentage risk represents a greater dollar amount. The difference opens up opportunities and strategies like naked options, undefined risk, or larger products that may not be feasible in smaller accounts. As always, be careful when hearing claims like I doubled my account or I made $500 today. Doubling is far easier in a small account than a larger account and a $500 gain is much more attainable with a large account than a small one. Without context, those numbers can be misleading and don't reflect the true risk or effort behind them. And I think one of the things that we say all the time is it's easier to trade in a larger account. And that's simply because if you're just doing one contract across the board, you can get super small if you're selling undefined risk. And more importantly, if you're selling undefined risk in a $100,000 or $250,000 account with one contract, you can absorb so much volatility and it doesn't even scratch your account. Where if you have a $5,000 or $10,000 account and you're undefined risk, a move like in Tesla or Aqua or these crazy moves we've seen, they make a much bigger dent. And it's just naturally harder to get to a smaller percentage of risk from a net lick perspective where your account value is uh, when you're dealing with smaller accounts. And that's that's even if you're doing defined risk spreads. Like if you have a $5,000 or $10,000 account, if you're doing three to five point wide spreads, 
that's still a large chunk of your account size, where if you're doing that in a $100,000 account, it's, it's not even going to move the needle, even if it's a max loss. Yeah. And, and I think it's always good to think about things in terms of exactly like this slide says, what you're risking per trade percentage wise to your account, I think is always nice. I mean, it's, it's in my head all the time. I'm always talking about it when I'm on air of the different trades that I may have on and how much percent it is of my portfolio. And as soon as something is somewhere between five and 10%, that's when I'm sort of, you know, and I'm not, I'm not talking short, really, honestly, like a lot of times it's, if it's, if it's long, um, cause again, there's going to be a little bit more on a margin account, just going to take a little bit more, more uh, value there, but something that's long specifically, if you're, if it's X, Y, Z percent amount in your portfolio, usually in my case, 10, like, I'm like, okay, this is kind of big. And I had a gold trade that was like that for a while. And I was like, okay, I'm making money on this. It's time to shut it down because it's a little big and I don't want it to control my portfolio. Yeah. And that's especially true. If you, if you have, let's say you put on a, a debit trade where it starts as a thousand dollars and it grows to 1500, $2,000. Now that like that total value is growing as a relative percentage of your account size too. So another thing to keep in mind is you know you don't you don't want to have a massive winner on the table without hedges where it's grown to a, a great degree that still represents a big chunk of your account because now from a piece of the pie standpoint you go from one slice to two slices to three slices with an unrealized gain there. Um, so it's another way to think about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. If you have those on and, and these names that are moving, you're lucky enough to catch a move. That's I think a lot of times it's hard for people to be like, oh, I don't want to take this off. But when you realize like, OK, it's not only is it 100 percent sure it could if you're long it, it can go to 200 percent. But guess what? You're already at a almost 10 percent size of the position of your portfolio. That's probably kind of your cue to like, OK, this is a little too big. Exactly. Next slide, please. Comparing strategies and underlyings. So uh, looking at denominators when comparing strategies, take this chart as an example, take it from one of our segments, comparing the largest intraday ranges for the mini and micro futures over the past year. We always use percentages or per capita data points because that normalizes different strategies or underlyings of different sizes. So again, going back to the, I made 500 bucks, I doubled my account, like what does that actually mean from a percentage standpoint? So when we look at the average percentage range versus the average points, these things can be very different and they should be with different denominators for all these products. All these products are different sizes. All these products have different notional values, tick sizes. So bringing it down to a percentage basis helps us put context around the implied volatility and realized volatility of the products we're trading and can give us a better idea of what we could expect given implied and historical moves. Yeah, for sure. And I would also say these things can tend to grow once volatility gets a little bit wider and crazier. This These average ranges get bigger. Absolutely. Final slide before we get to some takeaways. Selection bias. So finally, make sure you're not committing to selection bias and take all the information you have before putting on a trade. All of these IVRs, IV ranks, are above 40, meaning they all look juicy from premium selling strategies. However, take a look at another metric, such as the IV five day change. Some volatilities are trending upwards, while some have already started to trend down. This can mean different things for the overall strategy you want to use on that underlying. Similar strategies might not behave the same. So my big thing here, and the biggest thing that I harp on all the time is, yes, IV rank, helps us put our eyes on a product that has elevated implied volatility. But what does that elevated implied volatility mean? Like in TLT, we're talking about bonds and we're talking about uh, trading them. Like I don't care what the IV rank is in TLT because I know that with an IV rank of 100, the actual implied volatility of TLT is probably only like 16, 17, 18%. Like what, if the IV rank range goes from a zero of 15% to a 100 of 17%, the difference in implied volatility, which is what the option premium is representing, uh, is not that great. Where if you're looking at an Oclo or a Tesla, a Tesla IV rank of zero might be 50% implied volatility, where a Tesla IV rank of 100 might be 90% implied volatility. That's a drastic range, and you can play for that volatility contraction and expansion because the range is wider uh, in that particular product. So 
IV rank, IV percentile, whatever you like to use for context. I always am looking at the implied volatility along the right-hand side of the platform as well because that is what the representation is of the actual premium that you're trading in that product. You hit the nail on the head for sure. I mean, like when we talk about gold being in a 70 or, you know, 80 IVR, to your point, similar to TLT, gold is not only currency, but it's also commodity. But the currency part shows the IVR, the flat vol, as we'd like to say, which is usually, even if it's a high IVR, that flat fall is probably maybe 19, maybe 20, but most likely it's in the teens. And so if you're selling it, the base flat vol is probably like 14. You're looking for five ticks if you're lucky in that situation. Whereas, like you said, like the Teslas of the world, the Oklos of the world, I mean, they're in the hundreds and and the IVR is probably 30. But when they come in, they they could drop like 40 to points, right? In, in flat vol. Exactly. And I think utilizing, if you want to put get a better idea of how these things move, you could always just type in your ticker symbol. So like aclo.ivr or tesla.ivr, and you can see a chart of implied volatility rank and how it's changing. Um, and that can give you a better idea of the ebbs and flows of that particular product. And you and I, are, I will say you and I are seasoned in that way. We look for those higher vol, juicier type of IVR names to sell. Some mm -hmm. people are more comfortable with the TLTs of the world when they're when they're in a 70 IVR and they might be up to 19 and it might be on its way back down to 15. They only want that. That's that's cool. Just as long as you understand. Yep. Totally. A couple of takeaways for y'all. When working with numbers, ask yourself, what question is this number actually answering? Is this the right number to use for that question? Always match the numerator to the denominator and use percentages per share or per capita data for fair comparisons. Be cautious of numbers that mislead by showing the wrong scale, whether they are underestimated or exaggerated. Uh, this principle is especially important to grasp in trading where misreading ratios or implied volatility rank, percentile, what have you, can lead to costly mistakes. So yeah, totally, totally agree with this. And, and I think it's super important to always put a percentage on things. Like what is the percentage move? That's the easiest way to put context around product moves and things that are happening in the market for sure. If you're not subscribed, subscribe right here. And if you want to meet me and the team in person at our next live event, hit the link at the top of the description.